that Sunday evening, Sunday evening is the day we all get to it. <laughs> uh, okay, so last week uh, we started off a, a two-parter. Um, we looked at why, why go to church. And last week, uh, the main point was because we need each other. And we looked at that. Um, but tonight we're going to look at uh, the second thing that I hinted to last week, um, and that's so that our, our life has a purpose. If you want to, you can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Um, you know, we kind of have this idea that we have, to, we have to do everything on our own. You know, like we have to be independent on everything. And that's not what the Bible shows us as Christians. You know, sometimes we say, well, I feel so lonely. I feel like nobody's there for me because we withdraw ourselves from other people. You know, and, and the church is something, is meant to be something where we can, where we can seek after each other. And I seek after, you know what I mean now. Seek help from each other. That's what I need to say. Um, so, tonight I want to look at the idea that the church gives us life purpose. You know, when you're young, you want to know what's my purpose in life? Why am I here? What's, what, what, what's my purpose in life? What, what, what's some, another way that people, sometimes we ask that is, what's God's will for my life? You know, what's, what, what am I going to accomplish with my life? You know, and then when, as we get older, we kind of ask a similar question. It's, what good did I do? What legacy did I leave behind? Did my life matter? And I think that at, the, at its core, it's the exact same. It's just asked from different stages in life. And the real root of it is searching for a life purpose. I remember when I was a kid, um, I remember when I was a kid asking with much frustration, God, what's your will? What's, what's your will for my life? You know, I getting upset because God wouldn't answer, and so spending countless hours in prayer, like, you know, there was this one thing in my life that, that God specifically had had called for me, and I, if I seek, sought, sought God hard enough, you know, there would be this light from above that came down, and an angel would deliver a scroll to me that said, "This is your divine calling," but you know, that's not really how it works. That's not really how it works. In fact. And throughout the whole Bible, we see people doing other things in life. And when God wanted them used for a specific purpose, he let them know. There's Paul out there in the dunes killing people. And God's like, hold up. I got something else for you. Here's Moses out in the dunes just watching over some animals. And God's like, hold up. I got something for you. See, but most of the time throughout Scripture, people... They, they had their jobs, they, they, they did their work, and then God gave them direction when there was something else to come up. Other than that, like for instance, how did, how did the message of Jesus dying and being resurrected spread from Jerusalem to Rome? A missionary didn't bring it. Merchants brought it. People who were in Jerusalem trading, and then they went back to Rome to trade their goods some more, and they spread the message. They were just doing their job, their normal 9 to 5 job, well it wasn't 9 to 5, but you get what I'm saying. And then doors were opened, and they walked through them. It didn't have to be some grand mystical thing. And what I'm getting at here is the church shows us what our life purpose is. Many people gave me the Christian answers when I would ask, oh, your, your purpose in life is to worship God. Well, we can worship God in heaven. So if that's my purpose in life, I might as well die and get it over with. <laughs> See what I mean? That really didn't have a whole lot of umph to it. In fact, uh, there's been a lot of songs about this. Chris Tellman had a song called Made to Worship, and that was the whole, pretty much the whole idea of the song, where we were made to worship, or, you know, which is good. I mean, it's good stuff, but it, there's, there's more to it than that. So then some others said, you know, that I had to look for a sign from God, which if you're one of those people who looks for mystical signs, you know how unhelpful that is. You drive by something, you're like, there's something on that billboard. Is that the sign? <laughs> or you're driving, you see a stop sign. Oh, there's an actual sign. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's oftentimes not, not like that. Um, like, we have to somehow decode this magical thing. So, I mean, if you've ever been a kid, you know, you know what this is like. You know, you're flipping through scriptures, randomly turning into verses. Maybe I'll stumble on a verse. It'll give me this, this where I should go in life. And, 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 and it's not like that. It's just not like that. Um, so in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 through 27... It's there on the screen. Not, the words aren't on the screen. The references on the screen. It says, 
For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. Just as he desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer, truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are unnecessary. And those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor. And our less presentable members become much more presentable. Whereas our more presentable members have no need of it. The people who think that they're real hot stuff, that the church can't survive without them. But God has so composed the body, giving much more abundant honor to that member which lacked so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And that brings us to last week. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Did you see that? Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. So I, I, I'm not downplaying salvation, but... If our whole purpose in life is just to be saved, then wouldn't we die at salvation? As soon as we accepted Jesus, wouldn't we just die? But the fact that God causes us to live past our salvation, that tells me that there's more to our purpose in life than just getting saved. So keep, keep rolling with me. I know I'm kind of belaboring the point, but let's really drive this home. If we can worship in heaven... And we won't be lonely in, in heaven, and we won't struggle with depression or anything else in heaven. Then surely life isn't about the struggle either. But you know one thing we won't be able to do in heaven? We can't witness to people in heaven. We can't reach out to, to the hurting and show them that there's a better way. It'll be too late. And this, I believe, is the greatest reason... The greatest purpose in our life. To reach out to others. Now, last week I mentioned about part of that reaching out is reaching in towards each other as the body of Christ. We should be there for each other. But this week I kind of want to emphasize the reaching out part. Imagine how pointless it would be if you had a stream for irrigation, but you stopped it up. And so the irrigation water didn't go anywhere. It just sat there. What would be the purpose? See, a lot of times as Christians, we kind of live our lives like our purpose is just to live, just to exist. So here we are, fresh pouring water that's just simply existing in a reservoir. You get what I'm saying? But God wants to open up the floodgates and pour us out to the community. He wants us to reach out. Because... Water just sitting in a reservoir isn't helping anybody. Water flowing through the irrigation ditches, that's helping people. Fields are being watered. That's helping people. Do you see what I'm saying? God didn't create us just to simply exist. And throughout the Bible, we see kind of this emphasis of our purpose in life. He's, he says, for instance, that we were created for good works. God predestined before the world was ever even created, he predestined good works for us to do. That would be part of our purpose in life. So let's say you have a job, you work at the grocery store, and opportunities present themselves for you to show Christ to other people. That's your purpose in life. So you, you don't have to have, 
You know, not everybody has to be a pastor. Not everybody has to be a worship leader. Not everybody has to sing music on the stage. Not everybody has to work in the food pantry. Not everybody has to, see what I mean? Not everybody has to do the same things. What did he just say about the different parts of the body doing different things? If we're all doing the same thing, then we aren't really emphasizing our own individual strengths. If I tell each one of you, the only ministry you need to ever do is help out in the food pantry. Well, I might be wasting your talents. I might be wasting your talents. Not to say that the food pantry is a waste of time, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if you're gifted in another area, we should get you into that area that you're good at. See what I'm saying? We should get you in the area that you're good at. John's good at in the food pantry. Food pantry. So guess where he is? He's in the food pantry. I'm not good in the food pantry. Guess where I'm not? <laughs> in the food pantry. See what I mean? We don't always have. We don't all have to do the same thing. And so we need each other, but it goes beyond that. Others need what we have. God gives us comfort. Why? So we can take it to others. So we can comfort those who are suffering. God gives us wisdom. Why? So we can go yell at the sinners and how they need to repent? No. So that we can... See, see how that works? It's like a flowing river. But what Satan tries to do is he tries to stop up the river. He tries to get us only concerned about our own problems. He tries to get us to start nitpicking up how other people in the church are doing something. Well, I don't like how John's doing that. I don't think John should, John should be doing that because I just don't, no, I just don't think he's right. See what I mean? So then, instead of reaching out to others, I'm now nitpicking my own body. What were to happen if the kidney were to attack the liver? Well, that sounds like a bad thing, doesn't it? The, the body wouldn't be able to work with it. But for a lot of times, we as Christians allow ourselves to be consumed with gossip. And we focus inward. So if we need each other, then the same is true that we also need to reach out to the community. Others need the same light that we found. When you come to church, are you ever encouraged? Yes. Other people need to be encouraged too. God doesn't encourage us on Sunday so that we can go out and yell at people on Monday. You can retire from work, and that's fine, but don't ever get the idea that you can retire from ministry. If you are alive, you have a ministry. If you are alive, you have a purpose. You cannot retire from ministry. You cannot retire from loving people. You cannot retire from being a servant. You cannot retire from that. That's not something you have a choice of doing. Now, I'm not saying, for instance, pastor is the pastor. He might step down as senior pastor one day before he dies. I don't know. But with that being said, that doesn't mean that he doesn't have, he has to stop reaching out to people. You get what I'm saying? You don't have to have a position to love people. Does that kind of make sense? So you can retire from work, but you shouldn't retire from ministry. Even if you lose health, there's always something you can do to reach out to others. Some people uh, are stuck are, are kind of stuck up in their house that, that they can't get out. You know, there's still things that you could do to reach out to others. Especially nowadays, there's social media. You can spend you can spend your day encouraging people. You can spend your days calling and checking in on people. You can send out invites for different things. You can I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. We have a prayer chain. Um, you can get in contact with Becky and join the prayer, prayer chain. You don't have to uh, be mobile to be used by God. You don't have to be in perfect health to be used by God. You don't have to be young. See what I mean? You anywhere you're at, there's always some way you can reach out to others. And that's our purpose in life. See, society says that there's some people who are just have no purpose. They're a waste to society. Typically, it's the sick and the elderly. If you're over X amount of years, you have no purpose. We should just euthanize you. Well, if you, um, if you have cancer, we should just let you die. See what I mean? God doesn't see things like that. God's the one who causes our life to extend. Chuck had, I think it was an uncle, don't, don't quote me on that, but I think it was an uncle who should have died long before he actually died, but God kept the guy going. I mean, I don't even know how he was living. The, I don't even know, I don't think he even had lungs anymore, but he was still living. I mean, that's, that tells me that God's the one who decides when we go. And if you haven't gone yet, that tells me that God 
still has a plan. So just a few highlights that I wanted to say. Joe, who is 83, 83, he corrected me when we went to Arizona, 83. Um, Joe, who is 83, he helps in the youth. Norval, who, who his age is unknown because he decided he wasn't gonna have any more birthdays. So he is age unknown. He's on the board, he helps with all kinds of stuff. Norval's one of the most stubborn guys I've ever met. He's all out here with, you know, a messed up back and he's all unloading the truck like, yeah, I got this. <laughs> uh, we got, um, you know, the teenagers, uh, a, couple, a couple weeks ago, they cleaned out the van, spent, spent a whole day cleaning out the van. They went and did a fundraiser, raised, I think it was over $100. The, kid, the teenagers did that. Eli painted the, the youth room over there in, in the youth and kids building. Uh, we had kids in here a couple Sunday mornings ago, and I could hear them singing from up here behind the monitors. There is always something you can do no matter how old you are or how young you are. So sometimes we get this kind of idea, when I'm mature, when I'm mature, I'll start serving others. When I'm mature, I'll get involved in ministry. Here's the thing, guys. You'll never be mature if you don't serve others. A Christian who doesn't reach out is a very shallow Christian. James talks about this a lot. He, said, he talks about people who, who, who want to be recognized as teachers, but he says you'll be judged harsher. And then they also want to be recognized for all these different stuff. He says, you know what's true religion? It's to care for those. To care for those down and out, the people who, know, who society doesn't care about. That's true religion. Not having all the perfect answers. You know, sometimes, sometimes I'll feel like God wants to give me a word and I'll realize, God wants me to give a word on Sundays. And then I realize God doesn't want me to give a word because it's not about what I say, it's about what he does. And so I'll realize that he doesn't want me to say something. He wants to do something in somebody. And so then I switch from what do you want me to say to Lord, please touch them. Because it's not about my words. It's about God reaching people. That, does that make sense? We're getting ready to close up here. So just so a few final thoughts here. When you look at a fork, what do you think of? You think of food. Exactly what I was, that is exactly what I was going to say. When you look at a fork, you think of food. That's the purpose of a fork. You, that's why you own a fork. You don't just own a fork so you can look at it at the wall. When you see a Christian, what do you think of? Service, loving other people, reaching out. What was Jesus' entire life and entire purpose summarized? Loving people. If there's anything that we see from Jesus, is that he reached out and loved people. His whole ministry was about it. His whole life was about it. His death was about it. Everything was about loving people. All of it. When people look at us, they need to think servants of Christ. That's what we need to think of when we see ourselves. I want to be more of a servant, and I want to be less served. So we all have a purpose in the church and a way to reach our community. Happiness doesn't come from living life for yourself. There are some of us who are not happy in life because our whole life is about us. Not everybody, but I know that there are some people who I, I, I'm just not happy. Does your life revolve around anyone besides yourself? Because if you spend your life for yourself all the time, you will not be happy. You will not be happy. Well, I'll get the perfect job that I want, and then I'll do, spend my, all my time and all my money doing what I want. And then you know, there has to be a point when you realize it's not going to make you happy. It's just not going to make you happy. And I know that's hard for us to grasp because our entire culture is centered around that. You have to have this to be happy. You have to do this to be happy. Happiness isn't something you can seek. It's an effect. It's a, it's, it's a result. So what's the cause? Loving people. In fact, Isaiah says it like this. When you reach out to others, then your light will shine. Then I will bring refreshing. I think it is worth noting that um, statistically, people who are religious and people who have others in their lives live longer. Did you know that? A, grand, a, a, a mother who is involved in her daughter's life will live longer. Grandparents who are involved in grand, their grandkids' <coughs> lives, they live longer, statistically. 
People who are involved in a group or an organization, such as a church, that gets their life a purpose, they live longer. People who are disconnected and lonely and spend their life by themselves statistically live shorter. That's a fact. As we mature as Christians, we should, um, we should serve more. That's the natural result. And I already mentioned James 1.27. Um, I could have mentioned others. I just don't really want to belabor the point. I think you get it. To be a mature Christian, you have to serve. And you have to serve to be a mature Christian. I mean, it's, it's, it's chicken and egg, except it's both. So do you want to grow and mature, serve and love people? And there's just such an occasion. Next Sunday evening, we have the Easter egg hunt in the community. It, it, I, I know it's uncomfortable to do things like that. I know it's out of the norm. I know it's on, on, a, on a holiday time when you want to be with your family. But remember, every moment of our lives is not our own. Remember that. And we only have one chance to love somebody. And once that chance is gone, we might not get it back. Do you know what will happen between this year and next year? I don't. I hate being in front of people. I hate doing stuff outside of my house. But I'm going to be there next Sunday because I know that there's people who this event will touch. But no, I will be having out-of-body experiences because <laughs> I, hate, <laughs> I hate public speaking. I hate that kind of stuff. I just, I just... I hate people to be looking at me, especially when I'm not, like, at least this is a little bit better because there's, like, walls around and stuff. Um, so if you're looking for a chance to grow and mature, I highly encourage you um, for next week. And, and there's, there's other stuff that we do, too. You know, don't feel like you have to do everything at once, but start, start pushing yourself a little bit. You will either find yourself in a place of continual comfort, always pleasing yourself, or in continual discipline, always pushing yourself. You'll fall into one of those two patterns. So you start making patterns that will last and impact other people. Reaching out to God and others is our purpose in life. And we find that in the church. We find that in the church. Well, what's my purpose in life? Your purpose in life is to love people. We have an opportunity next week for you to do that. The church helps bring us a purpose in life. So I hope that that kind of makes sense. Um, sometimes it's not so mystical. Sometimes, sometimes it's, it's just real simple stuff that God calls us to do that we overlook because we're looking for a more mystical thing. You know, um, If you read in the book of Judges, for instance, there's a lot of people who were called by God to do a single activity. Their whole purpose, I mean, th th their whole life, they were only called to do one special thing. The rest of it was just life. So I, 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 guess, I guess that's it. Just don't overlook the little things, I guess. Huh? Um, if I can have uh, Chuck close his 